You've just seen powerful evidence of how a documentary can chronicle, illuminate, or move a people to action. One of the following documentary features has been selected to join their company. Children Underground, Edith Bellsberg. Lali's Ken, The Legacy of Cotton, Susan Fromke, and Deborah Dixon. Murder on a Sunday Morning, Jean Xavier de l'Estrade and Denis Ponce. Promises, Justine Shapiro and BZ Goldberg. War photographer, Christian Fry. And the Oscar goes to Murder on a Sunday Morning, Jean Xavier de l'Estrade and Denis Ponce. is about respect, dignity, honesty, and the right for every individual to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. The Atlanta Journal and Constitution, March 29th, 2002. We witness all the important moments of the lawyer's cross-examinations, including McGinnis's point-by-point -point destruction of police testimony. The film ultimately showcases two public defenders whose thorough work throws into sharp contrast the corner-cutting incompetence and prejudice of those entrusted to serve justice. New York Newsday, March 29th, 2002. Butler's case was assigned to public defenders Ann Fennell and Pat McGinnis. Lestrade and his crew started filming almost immediately, making optimum use of the surprisingly broad access they were granted by the boys' family, the defense team, and the Jacksonville authorities. Still, the documentary wouldn't be nearly as effective if it weren't for McGinnis, a sandy-haired, ruddy-faced lawyer who resembles former ABC News chief Rune Arledge. TV dramas usually portray public defenders as unsure novices or shabby has-beens, but McGinnis fits neither stereotype. He dresses with a southern gentleman's summery flair and works the courtroom like the Sharpies we associate with celebrity clients in silver Porsches. Did you do a thorough interview of Mr. Stevens? That's right, I did not. Okay. Who did you do thorough interviews of? Brent Butler. Okay. Anybody else? Mm. No, sir. The San Francisco Chronicle, March 29th, 2002. This spare, powerful film snaps us to attention and never allows us to look away. Common wisdom says a murder suspect should hire a high-priced lawyer, but murder on a Sunday morning shows that a lowly public defender might be a better bet. Or at least a guy defending Butler, a ruddy chain smoker named Pat McGinnis who drills holes in the prosecution's case from the start. In court, the lawyer lays into the detectives, all of whom seem about 20 IQ points his junior, with a quiet fervor. You've got to punish them for lying, he says comparing his methods to disciplining a puppy who soiled the carpet. Did you tell him you would arrange an attorney for him? I said we can make arrangements for that. OK. Did you make the first arrangement? No, sir, did not. Did you pick up the phone? No, sir. You just told the young man at noon he had a right to an attorney, right? Yes, sir. And then you told him you'd arrange for one, right? Yes, sir. But you didn't. That's correct. You didn't take the first step on making good on that promise. I didn't promise him, sir. I just made a statement to him. And no, I did not make a phone call. Okay. But McGinnis also was charming enough to draw laughs from Butler's parents the night before their son goes on trial for murder. No offense, he tells the dad, but I'm putting her on the stand because she's better looking. Just briefly, Aaron. Ma'am, um, you realize you're under oath? Yes. Is there any question in your mind that your son was home between 7 and 9 in the morning. No question. I know my son was home. Thank you, ma'am. Chicago Tribune, March 29, 2002. What they document is a brutal police investigation that seemed far more interested in clearing a case in the easiest manner possible because the victim's husband quickly identified the defendant, Brenton Butler, 
than in finding the truth. They also know enough to see that they have a TV star on their hands. He is Pat McGinnis, a public defender whose world-weary manner belies the precision and passion with which he picks apart the police's half-made case, both in court and on the street. Best documentary of the year? Who knows? But following McGinnis, hearing his insights into how to deal with a lying witness, for instance, is a fascinating procedure that grounds a powerful film about the potential for the American justice system to go astray. You uh, set yourself right up in his face, knee to knee, right? Yes, I do. And they teach you that in those interrogation schools you go to? Yes, sir. You've been to five of those, right? Yes, sir. And they tell you to get some physical contacts with the subject of the interview, don't they? What do you mean when you say physical contact? Touching people. Yes, sir. It's part of some of the techniques we use are in reference with touching people. OK. And you grabbed his hand, didn't you? I held his hand. The Boston Herald, March 28, 2002. The Jacksonville police are put on trial and murder on a Sunday morning under pressure to pick up a suspect in a crime that could hurt tourism. They violate all rules of law and humanity, such as the dark side of murder on a Sunday morning. He came up for cross-examination. There was a break. I went out to have a cigarette, and as I pulled my cigarette out, he looked at me, and there's no love lost between us. And he said, um, suck down another cancer stick. And I just looked at him and I said, I always enjoy a cigarette before sex. Because I wanted him to know I was going to screw him. Uh, I don't think the message was lost on him. And I did. The film's hope and optimism lies in the diligence of McGinnis and Fennell. These two are not so worn down by the system that they have lost their professional zeal. Their passion to work on behalf of their client becomes bigger than Butler. You get the message they are crusading for all they hold honorable and all that is right, good, and just about our society. At the end of the film, a viewer is drained but uplifted. This is the first two pages of the statement you took, right? Yes. <clears throat> now all this information up here, that's in your handwriting? Yes. OK. And I, Brenton Butler, am providing this statement of my own free will without any threat or promise. Uh, he didn't say that, right? It's correct. OK. And Detective Darnell is writing this statement at my request. He didn't say that, right? It's correct. <clears throat> and virtually all of your statements start out the same way, right? They do. OK. Everybody just asks you to write your statements, right? The ones that do. Mm -hmm. And what percentage would that be? I don't know any statistics. Extraordinarily high percentage, wouldn't it? I would say most you ask me to write, yes. And is that because you have remarkably good penmanship, or do you know? I just always assumed it was that uh, they were too lazy to write it themselves. Okay. The New York Daily News, Friday, March 29th, 2002. Finally, we get to the moment when the verdict is announced, followed by a surprising and revealing postscript. In other words, Murder on a Sunday Morning has all the elements of a real-life episode of The Practice, and in Patrick McGinnis, a character more than deserving of his own show, not to mention an Oscar. Winston Churchill used to say that the quality of a nation's civilization can be measured by the methods its police use in the enforcement of criminal laws. I suggest to you by that yardstick, we're in deep trouble. The Hollywood Reporter, March 28, 2002. Told from the perspective of one very dogged defense attorney named Patrick McGinnis and that of fellow public defender Ann Fennell, it illustrates not an instance of murder but the railroading of an apparently innocent young man already tried and convicted by the cops, by the media, and in the court of public opinion. The police had a problem. At this motel, there was a murder. It was a stranger murder. They are the most difficult to solve. It requires diligent police work. It requires attention to detail. It requires an appreciation of the forensic evidence. It requires careful analysis. It didn't happen here. But what did the police do? In Casablanca, they had the line, round up the usual suspects. What they did is they went looking for black people. Only the heroic tenacity of McGinnis is able to pierce what appears to be a carefully constructed police agenda born of blatant racism and designed to obscure the unlawful interrogation tactics and shameful investigation conducted by its detectives. 
Murder deserves its Oscar all right. Through either uncanny instincts or unbelievable luck, or a little of both, Dill Estrade and producer Denis Ponce were able to capture naked injustice in all of its harrowing ugliness. There is still a man out there. That man is 20 to 25 years of age. He's probably about six feet in height. He has a collar on his shirt. He still has a functioning gun. And because no diligent effort was made in the investigation in this case, likely some other citizen will come to harm because the work wasn't done when and how it should have been done. I ask you each, individually and collectively, to act with fidelity to your oaths, to well and truly try the issues in this case. And I suggest that if you do, this will truly be a Thanksgiving this week on Chevy Drive. I thank you for your kind attention.